You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Welcome, everyone, to a webinar entitled Assessing Contemporary Science in the Light of Faith, presented by Dr. Stacy Trosenkos. My name is Sebastian Mafud, and I am the Interim Director of ITEST. The Institute for Theological Encounter with Science and Technology, or ITEST, is an association of theologians, scientists, and others committed to a Catholic worldview in which faith and science collaborate in exploring the truth. ITEST explores truth theologically in the wisdom traditions of the human community and in the data studied in the sciences. ITEST's mission is to foster and disseminate the Catholic position that science and faith in God are complementary paths to human fulfillment. Before I introduce our presenter, Sister Carla May Streeter will open us in prayer. Sister Carla May. Good morning, everybody. A moment of quiet. Holy One, you have blessed us at this time by giving us your word as light of the world. In him, you have revealed your face to us. In him, you have revealed to us your love of matter. For you have pressed it to yourself. Breathe your spirit here in this session and on our presenter. That we might, even though we make distinctions, that we do not separate what you have joined together. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Sister Carla May. So now, I'm delighted to introduce our presenter. Dr. Stacy Trisenkos, scientist, theologian, and mother, has a doctorate in chemistry, a master's in dogmatic theology, seven children, and six grandchildren. She worked for DuPont before converting to Catholicism and leaving her career to stay home with her kids for 15 years, there becoming a writer and an online educator. She is now the Director of Faith and Science for the St. Philip Institute of Catechesis and Evangelization in the Diocese of Tyler, Texas, and she has just published her fifth book, Behold, It Is I, Scripture, Tradition, and Science on the Real Presence, co-authored with Father George Elliott, with a foreword by Bishop Joseph E. Strickland and endorsed by Father Robert Spitzer. She is a fellow of the Word on Fire Institute and adjunct professor at Seton Hall University Catholic Studies Program. Her work focuses on the integration of faith and science. Stacy and her husband, Jose, live with their family in Hideaway, Texas. Uh, let's give it up for Stacy. Stacy, welcome. Hello, thank you, Sebastian, for telling my life story. <laughs> I appreciate it. Sure. Um, th thanks to everyone for being here. I, it blows my mind that this many um, people are, are here on a Saturday morning to talk about an, an issue that I, I always think is, is of utmost importance in our time. Um, and, but, you know, a lot of people, they say, what do you do for a living? A director of faith and reason for a bishop. And, um, you know, after being a stay-at-home mom for 15 years, after being a research chemist for DuPont, um, it's, it's kind of, I know y'all, you all get it. Um, I don't want to boil the ocean today. And by that, I mean, I, I, try, to, I try to pull in a whole bunch of different concepts and fit them together, not just concepts about faith and science, but concepts and ideas about what we do and how we analyze our own moment in history. And I, I am more than anything a, a wife and mother and now grandmother of six. Um, and I, I literally spend every waking hour probably worrying too much. I try not to worry. I try to be faithful and hopeful and look at the good news. But I spend a lot of time thinking about what kind of world am I going to leave to my kids and grandkids? And I know all of you um, think about those things, too, whether you have children or not. You're thinking about what kind of world we're leaving. Um, 
so I'm going to, I'm going to tell you where basically where I am in my life right now and the work I'm doing and why I think it's important that I do this uh, in discernment every day. I, you know, I pray God grant me the grace to do your will. Um, sometimes I just need you to tell me what the next step is. Cause I don't know. Um, so that I want your feedback. I'm going to try not to talk too long, uh, but I, my point in talking to you this morning is to not waste your time. I, I always think that when I give a, I do a lot of talks and that's always the forefront of my mind. Don't waste people's time because they'll never trust you with their time again. And um, to tell you where I'm, where I'm heading right now, and then to ask for your prayers and your help and your feedback, because I'm going to tell you a secret. Even though I have a PhD in chemistry, a doctorate of philosophy in chemistry, I don't do philosophy very well. I never took a philosophy class in my life, and I've tried really hard to understand philosophy. Theology, I get, you know, it's, it's much like physics and chemistry. There's, there's observation of the world, and we derive all this stuff based on our observations. We, we have all these theories about how we think things work. With Revelation, you know, Christ revealed truths to us that we wouldn't have discovered with our own intellect, and we derive doctrine from that. So I get those two modes of thinking. Philosophy is a little bit harder for me. Um, but, but what I'm after here, assessing science in the light of faith, ultimately is to complete the scientific revolution. I don't think it was completed. I think uh, uh, scholars argue whether there was even a scientific revolution or not. Um, maybe it's just this march of humanity that God made us to know the truth and we would naturally seek to understand the universe that he created. Um, but there was something that happened in the 1600s and 1700s when, um, because of the Catholic worldview, frankly, started trying to quantify the motion of objects. We started trying to apply mathematics and quantities to what we see in nature. And that's where all these crazy formulas and things came from the, and, and ultimately quantum physics and all we know about chemistry and how we can use 76 of the 92 known elements on the periodic table to make these devices, which I frankly couldn't live without because um, it organizes my whole life. My, my kids... It organizes my whole life. As an aside, I have two daughters playing the bassoon in the junior high and the high school regional band, first chairs, both of them, very proud of them, and a son at a basketball game right now, and a granddaughter's with my husband. Well, my kids are going in all different directions, and I, I organize things with my phone. But we live in an explosion of scientific knowledge right now. And whatever started in the 1600s and 1700s leading up until the 1900s when we discovered quantum mechanics, it's not finished. It's still happening. And the really intelligent, brilliant scientists who are leading the way in a lot of questions that are being asked, they're like me. They don't know philosophy because they were never trained in it. Um, and a lot of them are not like me. They never found God. They never understood, as St. Paul admonished people in, in his letter to the Romans, um, that you have no excuse for not knowing God exists if you're looking at nature. I think scientists more than anyone have no excuse for denying the existence of God um, because of the things they learn about nature. Uh, no human could have created that. Um, so there's very much a need for guidance in our world today. There is very much a need for young Catholics to become scientists and to get the clear message from all of us. Don't you ever set your faith aside when you walk into the laboratory. It, we, it, it's the truth when the church says the Eucharist is the source and summit of the Catholic life. Everything we do our, our pursuit of virtue and perfection of the human person, our pursuit of establishing just communities and um, societies that can actually progress towards truth, um, that all comes from a Catholic understanding of the human person and relationships and of creation. And so I try very hard to get that message across to young people 
we need scientists who get all of that. We need scientists who understand philosophy, who understand theology, who kneel before the Lord of the universe and thank him for everything that he created and creates and holds in existence every moment of the day as we take every breath and our heartbeats. We need young people clear on that so that they can help, so they can lead the way in making decisions about science in the future. And so that's what I mean by completing the scientific revolution. My first book, which was also my master's thesis at Holy Apostles, was on Father Stanley Yockey's work. And he, he gave the message to me very clearly in his books, reading them, that science was born of Christianity. It took me a long time to get my head around what he meant by that. But what he meant was that this view of creation, which is actually different from any other ancient religious worldview where they're all some form of pantheism, thinking that there's a, there are eternal cycles and no beginning in time, that the world itself is a God or creatures are gods and not really understanding the one God triune and incarnational, um, you know, all of that has to be there to have the proper view of the universe as creation that's ordered and good and created with love. And so Father Yaki's work, he passed away in 2009, and, and I, I think many of you are probably familiar with him. I sort of became his cheerleader as I was graduating with my master's thesis, like people need to know about this. It's, it's not a triumphant claim, like we're better than everybody else. It's a confident claim that you do need to have a Catholic view of reality if science is going to make sense at all. And so in trying to get that message out, um, it, it became clear that that whatever happened in the 16 and 1700s, if we say that science was born of Christianity, uh, I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother. I also had five miscarriages um, as a Catholic woman. And so when Father Yaki wrote about the stillbirths of science in pantheistic cultures and other religions where they were yearning for the truth, but they didn't have the right worldview to bring science to a viable birth and discipline unto itself, it resonated with me. Um, because I, I know a little bit about what it takes to, to bring a child to viability. You know, you don't, you don't do it by yourself and you don't do it in an instant. It takes a lot of time and it takes a community. It, ta it takes a family. Um, so when he said that, you know, if you think of, si if you will, this is kind of a goofy analogy, but if science was born of Christianity during the scientific revolution and all the stuff leading up to it, and it was a baby, I would say that science today is grown up kind of like an adolescent. Now, I have four teenage daughters right now. I'm qualified to comment on adolescence and I have two older kids. If science is kind of like that adolescent that thinks it knows everything, hello, scientism, then science is desperately in need of its mother kind of like a prodigal child that needs to come back to a unity with the Catholic church and Catholic philosophy and Catholic theology, not because we want to control science or tell science, the adolescent, what to do, but because we want to help science mature into this grown-up form, a mature science that is completely integrated with philosophy and theology and all pursuit of truth. Um, and so I don't know who else is going to do that if not us Catholics. I don't know who else is, is going to do that. And, you know, if, if we gave birth to the child, we need to finish raising it. So um, and then we need to be there for it. So that, that's kind of where I'm coming from on all of this. And I hope that makes sense. Um, but that's the umbrella under everything I'm doing right now. So as Sebastian told you, um, you know, I was I was a chemist. I don't ever remember not loving chemistry. I, I remember loving biology. And when I realized that we were talking about proteins with drawing squares and circles and lock and key models to show how proteins interacted with each other, it disturbed me because I knew that proteins are not squares and blocks and triangles and things like that. Those are atoms that are, you know, hundreds, thousands of atoms coordinating together to make these macro shapes at the protein level. And so I loved biology, but that led me to actually want to know chemistry because I wanted to know how things work. 
I've always loved chemistry. I was not always religious. I grew up Southern Baptist. I um, left religion behind completely in the 90s. I went to study chemistry. And then in my 30s, um, about 20 years ago, I uh, realized that science does not have all the answers. Like I actually lived that life with thinking science has all the answers. I know what it's like not to have a moral code because chemistry doesn't give you one. I know what it's like to hold your firstborn child um, and and look at it as a, a highly complex composite system of atoms and molecules and wonder why you love it um, when you don't even understand what a human person is or a relationship is. I understand the havoc that can be wreaked on a life without faith and only science. So, so I, I'm not just saying this is an idea that science doesn't have all the answers. I know it doesn't have all the answers. Um, and then I, I was, you know, I, I became Catholic. My husband was a cradle Catholic a mathematician and um, became open to life. And my, I have five post-Catholic kids in addition to my two pre-Catholic kids. And, um, and just trying to, and just trying to be a good Catholic mother now and grandmother. So, um, so I, I take, that's why I say I take all this very seriously. Okay. So enough about me. I, you know, I stayed home for 15 years. I now work for a bishop, never saw that coming, but he supports what we're doing. Okay. Bishop Strickland supports what we're doing. He knows he's not a scientist, but he understands this is a very important issue. And I have his support on what we're doing. Okay. So what am I doing? I want to show you. Not that yet. Okay. To the St. Philip Institute. So the St. Philip Institute is an inst a 501c3 here in Tyler, Texas. Um, before I started working with the St. Philip Institute, I was an adjunct, still am an adjunct professor at Holy Apostles. I know Sebastian, and that's how I got connected with iTest uh, back in 2014, I believe. I've known Sebastian since 2000. 10 when I started at Holy Apostles as a student in dogmatic theology. Um, but I, I have this course, Reading Science in the Light of Faith. This course was um, a grant from the John Templeton Foundation to teach science at seminaries. And my idea back then was to, um, to teach us all to speak the same language. If if I need to learn how to read philosophy and theology, and let me tell you, reading the Summa ain't easy. It was difficult for me, but it was the same kind of rigor as reading scientific papers, but it was like, oh man, I got I felt like I was starting over again. Um, I think that theologians and philosophers need to go the other way too. I think they need to learn how to read scientific papers if they're going to be competent to comment or assess science in the light of faith. So I have this course that I teach. I've been teaching this since 2014, and my students all end the course with a field of research paper, which is they have to study. So I work them, I walk them all through it. We learn what the scientific method is. We learn how to, to analyze scientific papers. We learn how they're structured. We learn how to dig into the reference section and, and find papers that describe a whole field of research um, and understand the background and, and what's happened in the past and where that field of research is going. And then I teach them how to assess that research in the light of faith. So here's where they put their theologian and philosopher hats on. They have to look at the scientific research and just like the early church fathers did, just like the medieval scholars did, just like the church has always done when it engages with the culture it finds itself in, my students have to comb through modern scientific fields of research and understand what the scientists are trying to do but then they need to come through it, reject whatever contradicts doctrine. And, and that's we have a long history in the intellectual tradition of the Catholic Church of, of scholars doing that. Reject what contradicts doctrine and say why. Like if there's an evolution paper that denies the, the reality of the human soul, point it out, say that's not science, that doesn't belong in this paper. Those scientists overstep their bounds and reject it and correct it. But also, find, not, don't just go looking for the bad news. Also to look at what is happening in science that is consistent with Catholic doctrine. 
my students come up with all kinds of amazing uh, areas of research that I don't, because I can't keep up with all of it. Um, especially in the field of psychology, like they're discovering things in, in neuroscience that help explain behaviors, but they can't fully explain behaviors because a lot of scientists in neuroscience don't have an appreciation for the theology of the human soul. And so my students recognize that and, and learn to add to it and correct it. And then when, when they've rejected what contradicts, accept what is consistent they also just learn to identify legitimate opinions in the middle ground, which is where most of it is. Um, learn how to just, you know, like, oh, an archaeologist dug up a bone and they think it fits in with the human taxa somewhere. And they have these ideas and these opinions. Learn how to just leave it alone. Don't go freaking out about everything in science being bad, you know, against Catholicism. And don't go accepting it either, but have a healthy skepticism and identify legitimate opinions in the hierarchy of dogma. Um, the catechism even says there, there's a lot of room for legitimate opinions, meaning just like evolution is the perfect example. You can have an opinion of a more literal interpretation of, of creation. You can also have an, an opinion of, of evolutionary science, just not being, it's my opinion, not being complete, not having explained everything and be open to all the new discoveries being made in evolution and follow what the scientists are saying. You know, if they cross that line into talking about things that aren't science, go, uh, uh, uh. But otherwise, listen and be open to what they're discovering. And, and, and understand that a legitimate opinion, while you may hold it, your opinion is also, this is where so much of the fighting happens. Your opinion, just because you hold it, doesn't make it dogma. And so... We, we work through all of that and we look at various um, examples of, of people who are doing it right and doing it wrong. And I try to set a good example myself and do it right and analyze science in the light of faith. So that course um, has, has been very fruitful. I've enjoyed teaching it. Um, just finished up another semester recently. I also have a new course, Evolution and Catholic Thought, which I inherited um, and it, it is, I'm looking forward to, to teaching it. Um, Dr. Don Sparling, uh, may he rest in peace, taught this course to me as a student. Um, so it was, I, I have only taught it one, once, um, but it, it furthers these ideas. And it, it's a great honor and privilege to pick up where he left off and continue his course. I have another course. I'm an adjunct at Seton Hall as well, Seton Hall University. Only because Father Yaki was a distinguished professor there. It was kind of like a, a checklist on my, my bucket list, a an item on my bucket list to teach there. And I've been teaching there since 2015 as an adjunct, just two classes a semester. And I, I developed this theology of science. And whenever I have a course, I just make a website because it's easier to keep up with than a syllabus. But I have um, I take the students through Father Yaki's history of science. So we, we go through all the other cult, ancient cultures, the Babylonians, ancient Greeks, um, Mesopotamia, India, China. We go through all of their scientific contributions and we critique their religious worldview and notice how it wasn't conducive to a birth of modern science. And in the last part, we look at the thought of the last three popes on science. I have a new course just starting uh, in two days that is called Science in the Church, also inherited. And in this one, the students go through the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. We look at different issues that people are surprised to know the Pontifical Academy of Sciences deals with robotics, artificial intelligence and humanity, organ donation and transplantation, um, hunger, food loss, waste reduction, personalized medicine. There's a lot of justice issues there. Um, and then laws of nature for biology, biological evolution, always uh, an important topic to cover. And then we go through papal documents, all those, and then we write a paper. So that those are the courses I've developed and teach. And that leads up to where I am now. I was executive director of the St. Philip Institute I very much appreciate having gained three years of experience as um, an administrator, as um, 
doing all the, the I, I like doing the budget stuff and the, all the financial stuff and the human resources stuff. I really enjoyed that, but it also was keeping Bishop Strickland from being as involved with the Institute as he wants to be. It was keeping me from doing the work I really feel called to do. So he became the president. The executive director position is dissolved. And and I literally mean dissolved like a chemist, like it was broken up into parts and dispersed out to other people. And we have now a manager of operations who's doing all the administrative work while Bishop Strickland's doing the leadership work. And I have this new center for my a phrase that I like. It, it's kind of like theology of the body. It's theology of science. And um, Sebastian is responsible for this. Sebastian, my food, um, he called me up one day. God bless you, Sebastian, for doing this and, and trusting me. Called me up and said, hey, do you want to apply for another grant for um, a, a, something to do at Holy Apostles College and Seminary? This time it was with um, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS, and um, and their DOSER program, Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion. That was an honor to me to get a $10,000 grant. It was small in terms of grants, but $10,000 is a lot of money to start a new center with. And um, what, what we what we did in the proposal for the grant is hold faculty and student seminars going through some of the concepts I was just describing to you. So I I explained all that because that's what we presented to the students and the faculty asking the faculty at Holy Apostles to help out with this effort. And the grant also was, was provided the funds to build this website. And so we decided instead of just building a website, with these webinars on it, turn it into a center and continue to cultivate it, something Bishop Strickland supports. So he's supporting me in this role. Um, The Secular Science Organization, the world's largest general scientific society and publisher of Science Journal, which which I published in once upon a time in the 90s. Um, They, like my, like it's all coming together. They, um, they, um, provided the funds for this. So instead of just having a website, now it's a center, I can continue to curate it and cultivate it and add content to it. So that's where you come in. And I, I want to hear, um, I want help deciding where this goes from here. Um, I thank God for having the, the um, just having gotten to this point. It definitely would not have written the script for my life. But it, I'm very excited to have this. Um, just as a side note, the office I'm in right now is empty because I just went from working full time over in Tyler in the Chancery in an office there to now that I'm doing this and not managing people, I'm working at home because um, our youngest granddaughter lives with us now. We we are raising her for a while until my daughter can, and um, and I just want to be home. My husband's retired, and so this office is being painted because I don't like pink walls. I want them to be dark gray. And so we're painting them and then I'll have furniture in here. So I'm really in the middle of all this right now. So um, what I want to do now, 30 minutes into this, I don't want to take up a whole lot of time explaining. I want to show you now um, some, some actual scientific papers, what I'm talking about with assessing science in the light of faith. Here's one part of it. all of this is going to be on the assessing science in the light of faith work um, website. So this is the website that's set up. These are the workshop topics. Videos have been recorded, but they are not um, yet produced. Let me share again. I didn't share. Yeah. Okay. I did. Back to this. These are, are not produced um, fully yet. I'll just show you the one that, that is so this is what the videos are going to look like Um, our producer at the saint philip institute set up this beautiful background at the high school library and i recorded talks for all of these videos and he's going to fix them up nice but he hasn't finished them all yet this is just the first one and and what i'm saying here is what i already said to you so i'm not going to play it but um we're working on that the first part says Christianity and the birth of modern science. 
that is a talk um, that I've, I've been giving ever since I gave, I did my thesis and wrote that book about Father Stanley Yockey's research. And so it, it's one thing to say science was born of Christianity, but it's another thing to explain what Father Yockey meant about how he defined science, how, what he meant by applying quantities to nature that had never been done as rigorously before as it was in the medieval university. And to explain, you know, why he says you can see this, this view of the universe throughout the Bible, our liturgies, our prayers, and even you can compare to the liturgies and, or not the liturgies, but the hymns and the poems of other creation myths. And you can see a striking difference in the way the other ancient religions, and I go through them in the talk, Egypt, China, India, Babylon, um, and then I go through their religious views. You can see a stark difference when you when you look at it between our view of creation and all the others' view of of the world either being God, nature as a God, or God emanating from the world, like the world creating. And literally, the Greeks had a word monogenes, uh, meaning that that the universe is begotten by God, that it that it was born of, it emanated in. And that, that is very different from created. It's very different from saying God created the world as his handiwork versus saying that, that the world is just part of God. Um, it, we don't worship nature. We, we are good stewards of nature. Um, and so getting that point across takes some time to explain that to students. Um, but we go through it and, and I show the facts of Father Yaki's research. And the facts are um, where he looked up original sources in the Firestone libraries at Princeton University back in the 60s, 1960s, when they had these three and four hundred year old books out in the open. And he could he availed himself of that. And so he, he put the story together and I'm just teaching it. Um, but we, we go through, sorry, I know make you sick here pushing through. We go through why the biblical worldview is a radical break from pantheistic thought supported by scripture and um, go through the church fathers, what they taught. So it's all there. It's not, it's not just an idea. It's an argument he makes with lots of support. And I've made this argument with atheists. I've had these arguments and these conversations, and these debates with atheists and, and atheists many times have said, okay, I get it. I, 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 they can't deny that the Catholic Church had a lot to do with the birth of modern science. They can't deny it. Um, the best they've been able to say is, um, thank you very much. You can go away now. We've got it. And that's why I, I'm like, you sound like a teenager, <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I think we still have to engage and talk about it and still make the case, but we have to make it well. We can't just say science was born of Christianity without putting some meat on it. So that, that's what this, and this is the first that talk that was recorded. It's in a video that's going to be there. Um, and there's, there's so much here. It, it took a long time for me to be able to even give this talk in an hour. The condemnations of 12, 20, 1277, there's like 200 and something of them. And they all kind of make the point. But anyway, um, moving on to the next part. The next part of the story, assessing science in the light of faith. So to assess modern science in the light of faith, we have to know where we came from. That's why the history is so important to start. Scientific method um, I think it's then important for anyone, not just my students, but anyone who is who wants to understand how to assess science in the light of faith, needs to understand the history of science, needs to understand what what we mean by the scientific method. Um, it's always interesting to point out that angels don't practice the scientific method. Angels don't have bodies. And holy apostles taught me this. I had a class on angelology. Angels don't have bodies. Angels don't have five senses. Angels are created. This is from St. Thomas Aquinas are created to know all they were meant to know. Um, and they, they don't have to go through this discursive process like humans do where we 
notice things in nature. We see it with our eyes or we see it with our analytical equipment or we smell it or taste it if we're talking about recipes and food, uh, which is very scientific and very chemistry. Um, but we, we have to probe into the world around us with our senses. And then we have to use our intellect to make sense of it and to make theories, which are explanations. Observations are where we get our scientific laws. And I think that's amazing. Like this is in any like public school science textbook. Laws are what we observe in nature. We're looking at nature saying, hey, that ball falls to the ground at you know, a certain acceleration due to gravity here on earth. And it can vary in, for certain reasons. We, we see, we notice that we observe it in nature. We observe what the elements do. We observe that the periodic table has um, elements one right after the other with one successive proton after another, and that they're all ordered and that we can put them in this structure of the periodic table where there's a repeating periodicity in the properties of these elements and how they bond or don't bond with each other and make proteins bold. Um, we, we observe all of that and those are laws, but laws never become theories. Theories are something entirely different. Theories are what we humans, body and soul with intellect and free will, they, they are explanations about why what we observe happens. And so a law that we observe never becomes a theory. A theory is explaining what we observe. And there, there's confusion there in, in people learning about science because they have this impression that, that a, a, a theory that gains consensus can become a law. It doesn't become a law. They're, they're, they're fundamentally different. But to really understand the fundamental difference, you need to understand the Catholic view of the human person. Um, and to understand the scientific method, you have to understand the Catholic view of the human person. Nevertheless, you won't find that in the Wikipedia article on the scientific method. Um, so I, have, I ask people to read this. I have my students read it. Um, I think it's important for anyone to read to understand how much humanity is groping for the truth of the universe <laughs> um, and how we're trying to make sense of it. And sometimes when you read through this, you have this, you have this longing as a Catholic theologian to say, wait, 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 I, I can help here. I can explain what you're trying to do. We need to be part of that conversation. I then think it's important to read the history of the scientific method. So when you're completely away from Father Yaki's thesis about the history of science, if you just look in the Wikipedia article on the history of the scientific method, you see the huge Catholic contribution here. You also see that there were contributions from other cultures, but the emergence of the inductive experimental method, it, it, you see the um, Arabic contribution here from the Arabian world, how it came from the Muslim um, religious views, how they made some contributions, but that scientific, that Greek scientific corpus had to come into Christianity and part of it through the Muslim world into the universities and the, and the Catholic church in the middle ages when the scientific method really came about. And then you get to Galileo and Newton and, and, and up in continuing it today. So I have, I have students look at that. Then we go through how to find a scientific paper. Science Journal, by the way, the AAAS who sponsored this new center publishes Science Journal. It's the, the best scientific journal in the world. It, they cover all areas of science. That's one of the authorities on science, but you can find a lot of stuff in there that needs correcting from a theological standpoint. Um, nature, and then um, the Public Library of Science. I just show students how to find papers. Then, and th this is a talk that's gonna be on the Assessing Science and Light of Faith website. Then we go through the structure of a scientific paper. It's a lot like when I had to learn about the structure of the SUMA, not just, not just the structure of each question with its objections and on the contrary, and I respond and its responses to the objection. That's how a scientific paper is structured, but also understanding how scientific papers themselves fit into the bigger field of science. Hundreds of scientific papers now, especially with the internet, get published every day. And there's all kinds of peer review going on. There's all kinds of missteps. There's all kinds of corrections that need to be made. It's messy. It's not a straight line. And people say, follow the science. I'm like, 
that that implies that science is like a straight line. If you just follow the science, you're going to get a beeline to the truth. That's not how science works. It's extremely a messy process. And people really do good work in trying to pick out what is repeatable, what is supported by evidence from multiple different analytical methods. Um, And so I want to contribute back to theology, what theology contributed to me. I want to help people understand who aren't scientists. Many of you are scientists, but I want to, I want to, I think we need to help other people understand what goes into a scientific paper. So we go through, um, we go through the parts of a scientific paper, the title, um, the titles are not meant to be clickbait. The titles are very technical and the words all package in a whole bunch of concepts. Each word in a title or an abstract or even the paper itself, it's a lot like in theology, that little word package has a lot of meaning to it. You need to understand what the words mean. Um, The authors are important because it tells you who collaborates and sometimes who funds the work. Uh, I do a lot of research into fetal tissue research and um, I pay attention to who's doing it and who's funding it there. The background and introduction of a scientific paper tells you, a scientist who publishes a paper has to tell the scientific community what led up to the experiments, what, you know, in the scientific method, what work led up to the scientists having this idea. Scientists have to read all the work that has been going on before them and going on now, and they have to come up with questions nobody answered before, like the scientific method says, they have to come up with questions nobody answered before, and then they have to pick out which questions are meaningful. And then they have to design experiments to test those questions or find answers to those questions or test their theories or hypotheses. And then they have to analyze the data honestly, the prudence, um, they have to analyze the data very honestly and then come up and put, put their reputation on a, on a discussion and a conclusion. And they also have to give credit to all the other references. So there's a lot of scholarship that goes into a scientific paper And I'm trying to teach theologians and philosophers about that because, you know, I know one per, I know, I know two people who have PhDs in physics, theology, and philosophy. But most of us lesser mortals in our lifetime are not going to achieve that. Um, And so if you're a philosopher or a theologian, I don't think you have to get a terminal degree in a scientific field just to be competent to talk about science. But I do think you need to do more than read popular scientific literature in the New York Times um, or even Scientific American. I do think you need to go to the original source of the scientific work where the scientists in their own technical language are telling you exactly what they did and why they did it. Because that's as close as you can get to being in a laboratory with them. Um, and, and it's not, it, it's totally doable for a theologian or a philo- philosopher to learn to read scientific papers. Um, so we can all kind of speak the same language, like I said. So we, we go through that. Um, this is a cute little stirrup. What's he called? I can't, I can never pronounce the word right. But th- this is one paper is about evolution. The paper is very, here's the paper. The paper is very technical, um, but it's talking about that little guy. Some scientists in China found fossils from those little strepturine, and that's the name of that, that little <clears throat> animal you just saw. They found fossils and it indicated that Oligocene period 34 million years ago primates from China might have diverged between Africa and Asia for different reasons than were previously thought. So technical, so minute a contribution to the scientific world and and so not a threat to to our beliefs as Catholics. But, you know, scientists found some fossils. They're trying to look at the teeth of those fossils and compare them to teeth of other fossils of other animals um, found in the same region. And they're trying to figure out what happened in history. Um, why certain species diverged, why certain species um, became where they are and how they fit into the evolutionary tree. 
Um, and I, I like this paper because it's really boring, <laughs> even though it's about that cute little animal. But it also shows in the very conclusion how tentative scientists are when they make their conclusions. They're saying but evidence is not sufficient to rule out the possibility that stochastic processes also played a substantial role. What that means is we have an idea, we have a conclusion based on evidence, but there's a lot of people talking about these stochastic processes, which are um, uh, in, in, entropic processes, um, more at a higher level of energy um, management in a population. They're acknowledging that there's more to the story. So I think that's really cool that people see that, that scientists aren't always as um, as arrogant as maybe the popular literature makes them sound sometimes. Um, and then we get into more difficult concepts. And I'm going to wrap up just quickly showing you some things. There's plenty to criticize in the scientific community. So there's plenty in the bioethics field to just flat out say, y'all got to stop doing this. I mean, we, you know, there's huge conversation going on about fetal tissue research now where we, we have abortion legal since the seventies. And now, you know, they're not just throwing away those bodies. They're definitely not treating them with the dignity that we should show a deceased human and a, a murdered human. Um, they're now using those bodies for research. They're using these little babies for research and they're needing them not to be dead too long. So there's a lot of really disturbing things happening in this area as abortion clinics and research labs coordinate their efforts to get tissue as fresh as possible to the lab for genetic research. We have the capability in genetic now to change the nucleus um, to analyze the genetic um, components down at the molecular level like never before. Um, and there's, there's a lot of plans for fetal tissue research. So we, we look at some of that um, and, and we go through the papers and look at how they're broken down the way I show people how they're broken down by background, methods, conclusions. Um, here's another paper on statistical physics of self-replication from 2013, I commented on this paper, it's stochastic evolution. I commented on this paper because other Christians were commenting negatively. So here's, a, here's a, an article that came based on this, this paper about stochastic evolution, where there's an entropic contribution to the drive for different species to emerge says God is on the ropes, the brilliant new science, talking about stochastic evolution, that has creationists and the Christian right terrified. Um, a young MIT professor is finishing Darwin's task and threatening to undo everything the wacky right holds dear. So this is the, a, a left-leaning journal that was saying, aha, see, you are wrong, it isn't God. That's not what the scientist was saying. And then on the other side, the young earth creationists were saying the physicists breakthrough on the origin of life can thermodynamics of heat dissipation, that's stochastic evolution, explain chemical evolution. And they're, they're, in this article, they're rejecting what this researcher is claiming because it, it's not just saying young earth creation, it's, it's giving more details. So you have both sides that aren't getting it right. And um, and I, you know, I, I try to take the middle ground and show how you, we can be open to these entropic considerations as part of the story of how life evolves. Um, let's see, going on to another one. Here's another interesting paper. I mean, I have my article that I wrote here only because I, that's where I did my thinking about it. There was a research paper recently about um, Wagner's friend. Um, this is Tom Sheehan can tell you more about this, but it's this idea that um, that there is this quantum entanglement that that what's if, that particles can be very far apart, but what's happening with one causes what happens with the other because they they were connected in the first place, and um, also taking into account um, quantum mechanics, and taking into account Schrodinger's cat. Uh, where the, the cat is locked in a steel chamber for an hour with a radioactive substance and a Geiger counter, a hammer, and a vial of poison. If one atom decays, and, there, and so in, in this 
in this thought experiment of Schrodinger's cat, if um, this, this one atom of the substance decays and there is, we presuming in this case, a 50-50 chance that it will, and the cat's in the box and you don't know, there's a 50-50 chance that that one atom will undergo nuclear decay. If it does, the Geiger counter will detect it and that will trigger a hammer to shatter a vial of cyanide, which will kill the cat. So if it does decay, the cat dies. If it doesn't decay, the cat doesn't die. And so for that one hour, us people on the outside of the box, <clears throat> not with the cat, we don't know whether the cat's dead or alive. And, and so that's very much how quantum mechanics is. There's a lot we don't know. And so you, you have to write equations, wave functions <clears throat> that take into account it could be this, it could be that. We don't know during this part of time. And then at some point in the future, you might know. Like when you open the box and <clears throat> mathematically we say that opening the box collapses the wave function, but it's not opening the box doesn't make the cat die or make the cat be alive. And we don't really think, Schrodinger's point was, we don't really think that while the cat's in the box and this 50-50 chance that the cat is both alive and both dead, but the mathematical equations sometimes need to treat it that way because that's all we can say about it. So anyway, the building on the Schrodinger's cat, Wagner's friend thought experiment kind of doubled that. And it had, it had not just people looking at contained events where they didn't know what was going to happen in a certain amount of time, had another super observer watching the people who didn't know what was going to happen in the boxes in a certain amount of time. And in those boxes were entangled particles. So one particle does this, the other particle should do that. So it kind of exponentially multiplied the possibilities. And the point that they showed here is you could have one observer observing one objective reality and another observer observing another objective reality and a super observer observing yet another objective reality. And if you don't understand Schrodinger's cat, what some people were concluding philosophically is there is no objective reality. And so that was one of the things I felt like as Catholics, we need, we need to comment on, um, Another one just recently, I just wrote an article on this, was our universe created in a laboratory. Um, I'm not kidding you <laughs> that uh, the, the, I don't know if you can see that, Avi, I'm not sure how to pronounce that name, L-O-E-B, the former chair of the astronomy department at Harvard University and um, he's on the National Academies and Advisory Board um, and, and also on the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. He has this idea that our universe was created in a laboratory. Um, and he's talking about quantum tunneling or quantum fluctuations in a vacuum. Um, there is this idea that in a vacuum, some subatomic particles can pop into and out of existence. And he's proposing that, um, so, so there's other theories like the multiverse and string theory and the bounce theory where um, there's, there's a bounce and that the Big Bang was actually one of the bounces because the, they're always asking what came before the Big Bang and trying to explain it because scientists don't understand how to deal with a beginning in time um, or a creation out of nothing. So they're trying to explain it in certain ways. And this person's, this, this professor's idea at Harvard um, is that there is a more advanced civilization out there who understands how to control quantum tunneling and quantum fluctuations, and they can make universes pop into existence out of nothing with certain properties like the genetics that lead to Darwinian evolution that lead to intelligent humans and that our universe is actually created by a more intelligent designer um, and that we are probably created to, be, to understand quantum tunneling at some point so that we can go on to not be a barren universe, but to be a universe who creates us humans, create other baby universes in the laboratory once we learn quantum tunneling, but he says we're never going to get there if we don't get do something about climate change because we're going to we're going to become a, a barren lesser universe because we're messing everything up with um, climate change. So um, 
I think Catholics need to comment on stuff like this. Um, I think we need to be like, you know, like uh, I had the, this book here. Robert Jastrow ends this book saying um, for the scientists without faith, it ends like a bad dream. You scale that mountain of knowledge only to find a band of theologians sitting there saying what took you so long. Because I want to say to this person, it's God. And like the Catholic Church has been talking about this since before the time of Christ. I mean, the, the ancient Hebrews were talking about the God, the creator. It's all through the Old Testament. Like, like, hey, come on and let us fill you in theologically on all that other stuff. And, you know, you're, you're, you're going in the right direction with the universe created intelligently. But um, we got a lot to say about that as Catholics. And, and we stand in a long line of church fathers and medieval scholars and, and scientists so um, th- this, this is really happening. Um, the last thing I want to say is on the, what I mentioned about bioethics. There's a lot going on in the ability to analyze genes. Okay. So the breakthrough of 2018 was something called single cell transcriptomics. And what that means is um, by combining techniques here in this one, two, three point, by combining techniques, scientists can now isolate large numbers of single cells. What that means is they can take the lung of an aborted child, mince it up, put it in a blender and break it down with other chemicals until they get individual lung cells at a certain age of gestation. And they can take those cells purified from the tissue and they can squirt them through an analytical machine and sequence the genetic material. This single cell transcriptomics has the ability to determine the nucleic acid sequence of the entire DNA in each cell. And so scientists are trying to build this fetal cell atlas. Because one of the great mysteries in biology is how does a single cell zygote with its DNA, how does it divide into two, divide into four? How does it replicate and multiply until you get to that that blastula phase when the embryo starts to divide into different layers? And then how do those different layers, those totipotent and pluripotent stem cells differentiate genetically? How do some genes turn on and some genes turn off and know how to become brain cells, eyeballs, Hearts, lung, skin, how did they know to go from one cell to a fully functioning organism? And scientists, because of abortion and because of the single cell transcriptomics, can can now analyze the DNA of cells spatially from all different organs and tissues of a human body temporally over time. So if they have enough aborted children at every age of gestation, and they can take apart all the organs, different teams working on different parts, they can map out a fetal cell atlas and understand the differentiation of DNA from single cell to organism. And if they can do that, they think they can cure most pediatric diseases. So see, we need to, we need to be part of that conversation. Um, are we willing to say cures aren't worth it if that's what we have to do? Um, and I, I don't hear many people talking about this and, you know, personally, you know, what would I do if I were sitting in a doctor's office, a, a lot of this research on down syndrome, children and leukemia is happening. What would I do if I'm sitting in a doctor's office and my little baby has been diagnosed with leukemia and I knew the only treatment for that is at my disposable because of aborted children and research, what am I going to do? Am I, I mean, we can't we can't forever claim remote cooperation and evil and just pretend we don't know. We do know, and we do know this is coming for our children to have to deal with. What are you going to do? Am I am I willing to say let my baby suffer and die of leukemia because I don't want to be part of this? I'd rather not have to be in that position. I'd rather say to people, scientists, now find another way to find cures. You're you're not going to find the right cures this way by exploiting aborted children. So there's some really serious issues going on. I'm going to stop there. That is what I'm talking about. Assessing science in the light of faith. 
There's a lot of good stuff. There's a lot of things that help us understand more about theology and philosophy. There's a lot of places we need to guide what's going on. There's a lot of places we need to teach our children and young people in colleges. Um, There's a lot we need to be contributing to this conversation. So um, what I'd like to hear from you in the time we have left is what kinds of things should we be doing? And and I I know I kind of boiled the ocean there. Like I said, a lot of stuff coming together, but um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to spark some creativity and, and get some feedback. When we did this with the faculty at Holy Apostles, the webinars went past time often because so many of the philosophers and theologians were telling me things and I was taking notes because they had ideas about this stuff. Um, so I, I'd like to hear what all of you think about this and from here on out, just turn it into a conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Trusenkos. So um, the fun continues uh, during the Q&A session. We have some uh, comments and questions that have already been posted in the chat room. Uh, Sheila Roth, our executive assistant, is going to uh, serve as a moderator, and I will uh, turn it over to Sheila. Okay, great. Thank you, Sebastian. Our first question came from David Romer. Uh, David, if you would like to um, unmute and ask your question of Dr. Trisenkos, that would be great. Well, I went to a Jesuit college, and I was taught that uh, we know God exists because we're assuming that the universe is uh, assuming or hoping that the universe is intelligible. So in my mind, the Big Bang is evidence that God does not exist because it's evidence that the universe is not intelligible. But the people, um, what you seem to be saying, and I think the eye test people have the idea that uh, the Big Bang is evidence that God exists. In my mind, it's, it's a reason to believe in the Bible because the Bible says God created the universe from nothing. So it's a sign that the Bible is the word of God, but it's, it's not evidence that God exists. It's evidence that God does not exist. Do you want, do you want me to respond to that? I think um, Tom Sheehan, if he's here, he could also say something about it. Here's kind of the way I look at it. Um, I, I would never use one single scientific theory to say that proves God exists. So I, I agree with what you're saying. I would look at all of science, like everything, and say it's all evidence. And that beautiful sky behind Sheila, that's evidence there's a God. Um, the green grass is evidence there's a God. Rainbows and puppies. Um, the, the Big Bang, the idea that there was a single originating point is consistent. So that, that's why I, I use that language with students. It's consistent with the idea that there is a beginning in time, but it doesn't absolutely prove there is a beginning in time. Does somebody else want to comment on that? that that's how I've explained it. Yeah, I, I can uh, perhaps make a couple of comments here. Um, uh, a couple of decades ago, some physicists uh, named Bordy, Vilenkin, and Booth uh, had a very accurate and convincing proof in the physics literature that our universe had a beginning in time. Uh, they said that it is not past unlimited. That is to say, it is past limited, which means the past only is going back so far. So there was a beginning in time. And that has become a constraint upon physics theories, whether in a single universe, a multiverse, or whatever. Um, the idea that God created at a more sophisticated level than we see with our instruments is a very reasonable claim. And to say that God created symmetry principles, and from those came the laws of physics, and that, by the way, is due to a theorem from 1915 by a person named Emmy Noether in uh, Germany, um, that every law of physics has a symmetry principle underlying it. If all God had to do was create the symmetry principles, and from that flow the laws of physics, and from that flows the Big Bang, and from that, the quarks, and, and so forth, and the atoms and molecules. Well, that isn't random. That is a really sophisticated level at which God created. God created at a level more advanced and more subtle and sophisticated than we can imagine. So the Big Bang is not a disproof of God. Rather, it's an example 
of the process of God's creation. And um, I think that's one of those areas that um, both theologians and scientists need to spend more time looking at to grasp the idea that we as humans have certain expectations. God exceeds those expectations in a way that we are not able to completely comprehend. But we have to be deferential. We have to be humble and recognize that God can do things that we can't. Back to you, Stacey. Um, Stacy, we have a um, question from Father Vincent Uke. Father, would you like to unmute and ask your question of Dr. Trisenkos? Well, you know, as a priest and a confessor, um, it rarely comes up in the confessional about people using artificial birth control. And, uh, but there, there seems to be no uh answer to the, the, the demand that Paul VI made in asking science to look into why does the sex act have to be unitive and procreative? Uh, or, or even now it's questioned, what, you know, why even be married? So, uh, and I, I, this, I think, you know, is one of the problems that, you know, people living in mortal sin, their soul dies, uh, Holy Spirit's out of them, and, uh, and they lose less interest in God, which is more of an experiential thing. And, and I just find that it, it seems to me in doing spiritual direction that when someone is in mortal sin, it shuts down a whole important spiritual process and, and it makes us become more like barbarians where we can justify experimenting on fetuses and stuff like that. Yeah, I um, have been very impressed with Father Robert Spitzer's work in this area. Uh, he, he's put together some work. Um, I, I think he does an excellent job of uniting philosophy, theology, and science. Um, and he's put together some work explaining what it means to seek happiness in life, but explaining why we're made for happiness and explaining with scientific studies what goes awry for us. So it, it's something I think is going to be valuable for parents and, and kids to explain why you don't cohabitate before marriage. It's not just the church putting down a law that there's a reason that will thwart your own pursuit of happiness. If that's what you do, you know, higher divorce rates, um, why you don't live a homosexual lifestyle, why you don't take contraception. Um, so he's, he's putting the scientific studies to bear on the re the natural law of the church to show, to show why that teaching is there. Um, and I, I think the, the goal right now is to figure out how to, it's a lot of information, how to get that to parents, you know, like we, like I work with my parish just on um, sacrament formation, just teaching parents are busy and just finding the time to teach them about the basic um, teaching of the Catholic church, the basic, basic things that kids need to know to prepare for the sacraments of initiation it's a lot and it's asking a lot from them. So getting into stuff like this is even more. And, but I think it's critical. I mean, parents know a day can go by and, and you never think about Pope Paul the six and Humanae Vitae. And you don't think about the choices that you're making. And, and I, it's kind of frustrating because we, we need more time. <laughs> um, and I don't know how to, I don't know how to teach all of this stuff to parents or, 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 inspire them to want to learn it. You know, that's one of the dilemmas I had too, you know, being a pastor of a parish with a school, a grammar school. Um, and, but it, it just seems like uh, we're just not active enough. We got to do something. It's... Okay. Thank you. All right. Good. Um, we have um, some comments and questions from Dr. David Keyes. Dr. Keyes, would you like to unmute and begin a discussion? The, the question of, of miracles and other things often are in, influenced by the, the problem of distraction in that uh, you can talk about a, a miracle, let's say, at Fatima, where uh, we know that the participants at Fatima and the news and all the other things had seen the, the dancing of the, of the sun in the sky. However, astronomy doesn't see that. And so they are 
distracted. The, they have this this concept that that it means that the sun actually in physics terminology did all this dancing, but they ignore other miraculous aspects that are documented, such as they were they were soaking wet, they were all muddy, it's all over and they're all clean. Uh, you go to Lanciano and you have the Eucharistic miracle and there's a concern about the, the uh, nuggets that were said to have one nugget weighed the same as all the nuggets together at one time. But when you measure them now, that's not the case. So therefore they discredit it but they fail to see that we have muscle that is physically attached to bread, muscle that has uh, capillaries and nerves in it and everything of a, of a cardiac muscle. They know exactly where they come. And they, they so focus on this other element that they then uh, discard the whole thing. Uh, is socially, we have the, the issue of, of abortion. And you can see where one side focuses, they're distracted about the plight of the woman and how this is going to affect her life. And she's the one that has to be pregnant, but they cannot see the fact that there's another person involved and they have a, a, a person whose life is going to be ended. And so they're, they're completely distracted. And, and initially, I think it was that people were distracted by the, by the embryo and now Catholicism and all the social work is trying to get take care of the woman and take care of the child. So, so we run into these uh, various times when you try to explain things, and, and they, they find one little thing that they disagree with, so therefore they throw it all away. Uh, and, and I think Catholic philosophy and things like that can go into science and say, well, yes, this is true, but this may be an act of God. One, one more example, uh, when you go to the Tilma, you know, there are reports of a, a gynecologist and he hears the heart rate and things like that. An ophthalmologist looks in the eyes and it's as if it's a real live eye. Well, if I listened to it, maybe I wouldn't hear that because I'm not that, I'm, that's not who it's for. But for the gynecologist, maybe that is a miracle that was for him for that moment in time. And I don't discredit what he says. I have no reason to call him a liar. But I accept that the rest of the Tilma is, is so miraculous in its, in its creation, uh, the way it has maintained itself. It, it resisted a bomb blowing up right in front of it. Uh, it's really, there's no paint involved. There's just like this thin film. You know, and those things are, are miraculous, but I can't be distracted by something else uh, say, oh, well, they're, they're all making this up. And I was wondering, do you see that in a lot which, when you're with your work? Thank, thank you for that. I appreciate that, um, David. So I, I think I'm guilty as charged. I think you're talking about my criticism of the Eucharistic miracles in the, the book I just published. Um, I'm not going to lie to you. I was so mad that I was stomping around the kitchen trying not to use free Catholic language. Um, I, I was so upset when I realized that some things that I thought were true may not be true, um, that I had repeated stories that when I dug into it a little more turned out not to be true. So I, and just to give you an example, there, there's supposedly a World Health Organization report about the Lanciano miracle where 500 tests were done by a bunch of different secular scientists at the United Nations, and they were compelled to admit the Lanciano miracle is true. The, the problem is that report was a fraud. There, when, when a doctor went to, he just published a book a month after I did, Franco Serafini, when he went there to look at that WHO report that's locked in a, in a safe at a monastery, he asked for permission to see it. They put the Lanciano Miracle front page, a title page, and a back page, but everything in between was about a mummy, an Egyptian mummy. Um, so there is no World Health Organization report because that was one of the most amazing things to me. And I, while it doesn't make me discredit the Lanciano miracle at all or the possibility of miracles at all, 
I think we got to be careful about repeating stories uncritically um, because I, I don't want a young person to hear that story and believe because in the whole, in the real presence, because of that story. And then later hear that it, it was a, a sham. So, but that, but I don't, I don't want to also convey, like I do sometimes like only look at the bad news and not the good news. I'm working on that in my personal life. <laughs> um, but I don't think that discredits the miracles completely. I, I just think those specific things, which are distractions, you're absolutely right. Um, they can make a person wonder whether to trust the rest of it or not. So I just think we have to be careful about repeating some of these specifics as true. A lot of people still talk about the blood, the the miracle of the weights, like it's true right now and it's not. So just, yeah, but I'm with you on everything else. I'm with you on everything else. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Keys. Uh, Dr. Kevin Powell has some comments that he would like to make. Okay, so I'm going to read his comments here. He, uh, he states, I will suggest then rather than trying to create a theory of everything, the focus be on how Christians go about trying to find that comprehensive truth. John Paul II wrote in Fido said, Fide said Ratio that science and religion are two complementary ways to seek truth. So I disagree with Stacy's comment on what happens when there is an apparent disagreement between science and dogma. I would assert that a true scientist does not dismiss observations with, which contradict dogma. Perhaps the science is misunderstood. Perhaps the dogma is erroneous. The scientist chases truth wherever the evidence takes them. And given my grades in engineering classes and in theology classes, I assume my misunderstanding is almost always in the theology. Yep. I, I, wish, um, I wish I could hear from you, um, Dr. Powell, because I, I do agree with what you're saying. So don't, don't just pick it out and discard it like it's a louse, <laughs> um, but actually deal with it and, and say, are there times when our understanding of divine revelation needs to deepen and needs to mature. And, and I think, uh, how did somebody put it, that science can enrich theology in that way, if it helps us always with the human person. Like, I, I don't understand. I don't understand how the, the body and the soul are one. I, I don't, I, I still fall into dualism myself a lot when, in my thinking, because I, I just can't quite put them together. Um, I just know if I'm hungry, I'm grumpy. And no matter how much I try to practice virtue, I still might bite your head off um, <laughs> if I'm hungry. <laughs> and so I, I know they work together, but, but I, I, I like what you said about don't just, I'm just reading it. Um, when there's a disagreement between science and dogma, the true scientist doesn't just say, I'm, I'm not even going to think about that. There might be something to learn by thinking about that. I think that's what you're saying. And I agree with you. Okay. Uh, can I come in and add a little bit to that? Um, yes, Tom. The, um, uh, several of the works by Jack Haught in his recent books have kind of dealt with the question of both and the type of answers where they are indeed what your science says is true and also what your religion teaches is true. And what it requires is stepping up to a higher level. If a question is asked on one level, people may expect a certain answer. You ask it on a different level and step up to a higher level, you may find that the answer is both tr are true. Uh, way back long ago, St. Augustine gave the famous line that the book of nature and the book of scripture are both written by the same author and will not be in conflict when properly read and understood. Well, our idea of properly read and understood has advanced quite a bit over the intervening uh, centuries, and we can see things now that we didn't see before. Uh, in Galileo's days, there were guys who would absolutely refuse to look through the telescope at all because they were so convinced of their dogma or their interpretation, what they thought was dogma, to the effect that all the sun and the moon and everything goes around the earth. And they thought that if they even looked at Galileo's telescope, 
They might be cooperating with evil in some way or other. Those were people who could not grasp the concept of a both and answer. They had to have an either or answer. And that's a mistake that all of us in the present age have to be careful of, is to be free and open to look at those higher levels of understanding that will make both answers true. Stacey, back to you. Yeah, it's that that higher level of, of thinking. And I, I don't want to be cliche here, but it, like you hear a lot of people in education talk about the lack of the ability to think critically. Um, I, I know I'm thinking of um, Bernard Lonergan and his different levels. Uh, kind of, it's kind of follows, I guess, what Aristotle said. But you you have your your things you deal with in daily life, and then you get to that different plane where you're you're making decisions about the best way to go through your morning routine to get out the door earlier or whatever it is. But then you get to this higher plane where you're contemplating the meaning of life. And then you get to that transcendent plane where, where you're contemplating the meaning of your, of your existence and God, and you, you get to that level. And we talk about that as Catholics. I mean, that, that was hard for me to be able to, to understand what that means to go into some transcendent plane. Cause I go, I go to adoration and be like, what, what am I supposed to be thinking about? Um, it, it is a skill. I've learned since that it, it's a skill that you, it's a, it's a grace and a skill that you have to practice to be able to even get on that plane. I think Aristotle's wrote something. <laughs> I just remember it. Cause on my 50th birthday, I thought I've arrived. I'm, I'm going to be 53 next month. Aristotle wrote something about how you don't achieve wisdom until the age of 50. <laughs> and, and I think what he meant by that is that it, it, you have to have all these experiences in your life to get to the point where you truly can think on a transcendent plane. Um, and I don't know about y'all, but like I'll be 53. I'm grandmother now. I really do think about like, what, what am I going to do with the rest of my days that will leave the world a better place? I don't, I live in a, I live in a in hideaway, which is a gated community. And a lot of people here get up and, and go play golf every day or pickleball. And I'm like, no, I want to know what we can do to make a difference. Um, so I, I'm not sure how we help younger people get to that point, but um, I know having lived enough years, I, I feel like I kind of understand what that means. Stacy, this is Dave again. Uh, I think I tried to address that in, in the book I, I wrote in the discovering the fullness of reality and how really, you know, science asks different questions than what theology has. And, and sometimes there's a little bit of overlap, but, you know, science is basically asking what and the how and, and theology is asking the who and the why. And a lot of people, they just get stuck in this one narrow thing. And, when you do science, you, you learn very much about the narrow. And the more you study, the narrower it gets. Uh, but reality has to encompass everything and in all different viewpoints. And you can have multiple truths that are apparently contradicting until you see that they're not asking the right questions or they're, they're situations that are only for a certain uh, space and time. So, yes, That's scientists know a lot about very little. Okay, we have uh, comments and questions from Sebastian Mafud. Sebastian, would you like to pose this? Certainly, and thank you, uh, Sheila. Um, Stacy, uh, ITES has been around long enough. We were founded in 1968 by Jesuit Father Robert Brungs. Um, to have uh, witnessed other faith science organizations come into being. Uh, consider uh, Father Spitzer's The Magis Institute and um, uh, Stephen Barr's uh, uh, Society for Catholic Scientists. Um, here we are witnessing the birth of a new faith science institute, the, uh, the Center for Theology of Science. And uh, we're delighted uh, to, have, um, to have your presence uh, with us at this level uh, of establishing your own institute. 
what kind of institute is are you is the uh, the center for the theology of uh, science is it a um, a networking institute will it have memberships uh, possibilities is it a resourcing institute will it uh, uh, put out a publication and invite uh, submissions uh, where do you see yourself going forward and how can we help that that's a very good question um at this point, it's in the curate phase. So I'm, I'm getting the next thing to do is to get the videos that I made on the site so that we can complete the grant requirements of issuing mini grants for faculty members at Holy Apostles College and Seminary. So they're going to write ideas about how to integrate science in some of their seminary courses in a way that makes sense um, and, and then have some funds to do that. The next phase after that, now that that now that it's part of so Bishop Strickland's St. Philip Institute is 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 kind of um, a new way of doing evangelization and catechesis in a diocese. He founded it as a separate 501c3. And so by putting the center in that institute, we have resources um, for, for me to be on staff to oversee it and for us to think about bringing in other people as budgets allow and for me to even undergo a fundraising campaign. So that is something I will, I learned a lot about doing that stuff as executive director. And so now, you know, I, I can do it just in, in my field. Um, but I don't want it to just be the Stacey Tresankos Institute. I, I'm getting it off the ground. Um, I have some ideas, but I need other people to be involved in it. I would love to see it become a publication. I think there's very powerful, you know, I'm a writer. I love the written word. That's how we, that's how we speak to the future by writing things down. Tom's book, Every Win, you know, I can see people 30 years from now reading that and going, I get what he's saying and it changes the way they think. So I would love to have some kind of publication there. Um, and I would love to have some kind of fellowship where we can bring people in and have regular meetings to discuss what comes next, um, like an advisory board within that. And right now, the, the first thing I've done getting beyond just the grant and getting it started, I have reached out to the Magis Center and to Father Spitzer. Um, I would like to take his enormous body of work on the defense of the moral teachings of the Catholic Church and and make that into modules to teach parents. And I, and I just want to start in our diocese, start holding clinics for parents. Um, here's, here's some ammo to use when you're talking to your, your growing kids about cohabitation and contraception. Contraception is a big thing here and it's everywhere. But I mean, in Texas, everybody loves Jesus because there's so many Protestants who are very fired up about their faith, but they all use, they all think contra they don't understand that contraception works the family. So I just, I want to develop some classes right here in conjunction, in collaboration with the Magis Center uh, to start in our diocese and maybe take them beyond the diocese, but that's not something I can do alone. So I need people who are willing to help contribute to that to help add their scholarship. If you have books and you want to add your scholarship and make some videos and make some modules and some courses. I mean, there's a lot of online schools popping up everywhere. Uh, Holy Apostles is the, the best one. They were the first ones that are doing it right. Um, but I think there's a lot of opportunity to get the message out. So I, what I have for 2022 is a collab I want to pursue that collaboration with the Maja Center or just be a customer of their materials, buy their books and, and help communicate what's in there. Um, and I want to get the many grants going with Holy Apostles College and Seminary. And we're, we're holding a team camp this summer that we're planning. So there's a lot of planning just going into those things. I would like to get a team together and write a John Templeton Foundation large grant. Um, uh, on something about the theology of science, but um, I haven't started that yet, but it's on my list for 2022. Thank you, Stacy. Um, uh, Dr. Tresenkos, um, if you would, um, would you allow uh, the members, there's 35 people in this room, and they're all here because they have an interest in the, uh, in the conversation um, uh, that, uh, that shares the relationship between faith and science. Um, so this is a, uh, a pool 
uh, from which you could draw resources and networking opportunities and, um, and volunteer, uh, uh, those, those kinds of things. Uh, would it be okay if people contacted you uh, to volunteer or sure. to share with you the resources or mm -hmm. to, um, uh, I imagine you're forming some kind of board uh, to, uh, to volunteer to uh, serve uh, Bishop Strickland and the Diocese of Tyler and your work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and, I, and I have email addresses from this list. If y'all don't mind, I can follow up with this. Um, and if you send me an email and you don't hear from back from me, Sebastian knows, um, nudge me again. I, cause in the transition of coming home, I, there was just a lot of stuff flying around and I'm, I'm trying to cut out all the things I do and focus more on a few things. Cause I, I sort of had like a lot of different things going on and, uh, I'm, I'm trying to refine that. I have an assistant who can help me with my email some. So yes. Um, well, I'm speaking on behalf of Holy Apostles College and Seminary. Uh, the work that you've done uh, this year with uh, with the students and the faculty at the college has been exemplary. And I know that um, uh, that it's going to have an impact on the way the syllabi are going to be created uh, going forward. Uh, there is a group of persons who are adding at least one faith science student learning outcome on their syllabus. And, uh, and that uh, will help uh, uh, activities be prepared uh, that demonstrate that the students are meeting that outcome. And the more uh, scientists can talk about uh, their faith and the more uh, theologians or seminarians or, or whomever um, studying faith can talk about science, uh, the closer we're going to become, uh, we're going to be able to come to uh, demonstrating that there's complementarity, not conflict. Uh, between the two fields. So, uh, so you, uh, you honor us, Dr. Trosenkos, with your presence among us. So thank you. Uh, Tom, do you have anything else you'd like to say uh, uh, before uh, I ask uh, Dr. Trosenkos to give a summary statement? Um, well, no specific things. Uh, what I'm hearing, uh, certainly from David Keyes, as well as from uh, Kevin Powell and others, is uh, all very, very helpful and very um, um, useful in combining these thoughts and putting them together. Uh, obviously, I think Stacey's on the very much the right track, and I hope her uh, whole program will go extremely well. I'd be happy to be part of her uh, coterie of colleagues who pursues it. And I think that... Um, the task at hand is a very, very big one to understand or interpret science in the light of faith. It takes an openness and a willingness to start and be open to science and not to be afraid that science will lead in the wrong direction. A lot of evidence out there of particular scientists leading in the wrong direction, but we are different scientists. and We can go in the right direction if we team up together. Thank you, Sebastian. Certainly. Um, uh, and thank you, uh, Dr. Sheehan. Thank you, Tom. Um, uh, Dr. Shazankos, do you have any final thoughts? I just appreciate prayers. Um, I, I know this stuff makes a difference to, to people as young as high school students. <clears throat> I taught at Colby Academy for about four years when my own students, my own kids were students there. I got free tuition if I taught. So, um, but I, I still hear from some students in those days who are now becoming college graduates. Um, they're I, I just like us as, as um, wise people over the age of 50, those of us that are, I, I would like for us to be able to provide guidance to them. I, I had a young woman call me yesterday who is a biochemist in her senior year, her second semester of her senior year, getting ready to pursue her dream of being a biochemist. And she's giving it up because she's afraid. She, she found in her own lab at her Christian university that they were using fetal cells in one of her experiments. And, and she said something to the professor and, and he let her off the hook, but she's afraid to go into the biomedical field and, and I, she's not alone. I hear from students like this all the time. They're giving up those careers because they don't know what to do about the bioethical issues. And I tell them, you know, you got to pray about it and discern, but 
maybe you're not supposed to give it up. Like, like, um, like Dr. Powell was saying, maybe you're not supposed to give it up. Maybe you're supposed to dive into it and be a leader for change. Um, maybe you're going to have to be a warrior. Maybe you're going to have to fight in a, in a way that makes sense in our times. So I would appreciate just a lot of a prayer um, the grace for clarity for all of us as we, we help guide these young people to have courage and prudence and, and to not be afraid to take the stands they need to take, but to take their stands in ways that are, that are not just shouting that are in ways that will actually make things different. Well, God bless us. Um, especially as we move forward, um, with that, for those uh, who are looking for ways to uh, better understand the bioethical arguments in light of our faith and our science, uh, the National Catholic Bioethics Center uh, is an excellent resource. They have a National Bi- Catholic Bioethics Quarterly, um, which uh, includes uh, lots of discussion uh, and uh, many articles um, specifically focused on, you know, how do we respond uh, in a responsible manner uh, in a world where uh, bioethics is becoming increasingly important. Um, Holy Apostles College and Seminary will provide academic credit for those, uh, graduate credit for those who go through the National Catholic Bioethics Center if they would like to pursue that. And, um, and I, will leave, uh, I will leave my shameless uh, promotion and plug uh, for the college uh, with that. And we'll move on. Uh, we have uh, uh, Pittsburgh Diocese Seminarian, Nick Whitehead who is going to lead us in our closing prayer. Nick? Thank you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord God, creator of the universe, you made us in your image and likeness so that we might come to know and love you and all things in you. The mysteries and wonders of this world attest to your infinite power and glory the gift of faith and the light of reason that you bestow on us attest to your infinite grace and love. Send your spirit upon us and fill us with your wisdom, with your courage and your blessings, so that we may devote ourselves to our work, our work in the sciences, in our families, and in the church. May we draw ever closer to you, the source of all knowledge. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, the wisdom of God, and our Blessed Mother Mary, the seed of wisdom. Amen. Amen. And thank you very much, Nick. Uh, Before we close, I'd like to highlight that we have another webinar uh, coming up on February 12th, uh, Transhumanism and Transcendence, What Are We Becoming? with presenters Sister Ilya Delio, OSF, and Nicholas Sparks. Uh, I wish everybody a very blessed uh, weekend, a very happy time between now and the time we come back together on February 12th, and this concludes today's webinar. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization, and don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.